we're looking at the Knicks Celtics game that's due to take place on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. So I had to bring in my resident Knicks insider, Mr. Uh, I don't know if you are an insider, but I consider you to be an insider. Mr. Jonathan Macri from the Knicks school, Film School, uh, also known as the Dean of the Knicks Film School. What's popping, what's popping Macri? Um, I'm like, I'm an outsider that that mingles with insiders, I guess. I don't know. I'm See, certainly that, but, not. If I'm on the inside of something, that no one else should want to be on the inside of that same thing. But then again, it could be like, hey, if you want to be a millionaire, you need to mingle with millionaires, right? Act as if, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've made a living out of act as if. Uh, it's it's gone well so far. No one has, no one has discovered me as of yet. So that's a good thing, right? Yeah, I mean, whenever I see you, like you just partnered with Madison Square Garden for like a whole thing, right? So, like, if you're faking it till you make it, you're doing a really damn good job. Um, yeah, I like faking it. Faking it is fun. It's not always fun with the Knicks, um, but I, I shouldn't complain. It's been it's been a it's been a mostly fun season um, to watch. They've been they've won more games than they've lost, which is always nice. They have some good things going on. Um, the conversation around the team isn't always that much fun, but uh, I do like this team. I like this team. I, I don't love them as much now because they're not whole. We could probably talk about that, but yeah, uh, it's been a fun season. So first thing I want to get to is you got the Celtics, best record in the NBA, coming yes. after loss against the Magic. I'm taking this game against Miami as another scheduled loss. Uh, for anyone listening, we're recording before the Heat game. You know, Jalen Brown sitting out, Smart's out, Brogdon's out, Al Horford's out. <clears throat> It's a scheduled loss in my book. If they win, it's not going to be because they the the it'll be because the Heat played bad instead of the Celtics played well. But then they come into the Knicks game, I'm assuming close to full health. New York versus Boston's always one of those games where there's a bit of a rivalry there. There's a the, the locality of everything kind of brings out the best in both sides. Are you scared of the Celtics? Are you excited to see them? How do you think the Knicks are gonna deal with the ball movement? Um, well, they didn't deal with it very well the last time. Um, the Knicks gave up approximately 8,000 threes against you guys last time, but that was very early in the season. I want to say, I'll look it up right now. It was definitely within the first, within the first month. Um, I mean, you know what it is? I, I think I would be more excited for this game. Yeah. That was the ninth game of the season. Um, when we, when we gave up like a million threes, I think it was 27 or 28 was the exact number. Um, I think it was the most three guy threes you guys have ever had in a game, if I if I recall correctly. I think um, they've beat that like five games in a row. Like they've done it five different times this season. I, I would I believe that. Um, yeah, I would be more excited for this game if Mitchell Robinson was healthy. Um, so you know, for anybody listening who may not be as familiar with how the next season has gone, they were kind of a disaster over the first. 13 games of the season, especially, um, culminating in a game. Sorry for that. Uh, culminating in a game at home against the Oklahoma City Thunder, who, granted, have gone on to continue to have a very nice year and might, you know, make the play in, but they gave up 145 points at home to the Thunder. And this was coming off the game against you guys, where we gave up a million threes, a game against Atlanta, where we were up by 20, ended up losing by more than 20. And there was, oh, there was a game against Brooklyn in there. In which they got killed. And that those four games were all within like a seven game span. So then they went out west for a five game road trip that was supposed to be like the beginning of the end for them. And they actually went three and two. They played pretty well. They they started to discover some things. And then in the last game of that road trip, they um for the first time all year had the what what everybody seems to believe is the the starting lineup that they they wanted to run all along or that Tibbs wanted to run all along which was, you know, the the mid three, as it were, Brunson, Randall, and Barrett, and then Mitchell Robinson and Quentin Grimes. And then once they went to that starting lineup until a week ago, basically, that starting five had, um, you know, led them to one of the five best net ratings in the league. And, and again, we're talking about a span of like close to two months or like over a month and a half. So I don't think it was like fool's gold. Um, and then a few weeks after they went to that starting five, they went to their shortened rotation. It was a nine-man rotation. That, that had some very good numbers. And then I think what happened over the course of time is two things. And this is why I'm not really excited about this Boston game. For one, uh, Mitchell Robinson went down with an injury. 
So he went out uh, early against Washington. He's missed the last two games. They've given up. I think they gave up 139 points to the Hawks, and then they gave up a bunch of points to the Raptors in their most recent game. Their defense just isn't the same without Mitch, and I understand he's only one guy, but and I don't know, maybe you guys have a similar experience with, with Robert Williams, although you guys have a lot of talented defenders on your team. The Knicks don't have a lot of great defenders, and I think what, what um, Mitch's absence has really revealed is like they specifically struggle their perimeter defenders to – stay in front of guys to close out to navigate screens and like they get away with a lot of stuff i think they're uh, maybe a little bit more aggressive when they know mitch is back there in the paint and now mitch isn't back there and it's isaiah hardenstein who has not had a good year for the knicks um they've still you know trying to figure out how to use him it's only game you know 48 or whatever it is and then uh jericho sims who's like a second year player who's nice but he's not mitch robinson so the other thing is, like, the, I think the starters have kind of worn down a little bit because they play a lot of minutes because they're a very top-heavy team. They've kind of, you know, Tibbs has, has increasingly relied on this top six. So the five starters and quickly, quickly was out the last game. He's questionable for um, the game tonight against Cleveland. So we don't even know if he's going to be there for the Celtics game. He's kind of the glue that holds it all together. Um, no Mitch. And so you add it all up, and it's like this isn't – the version of this team that's going into the game against Boston, it's just not the version that has played pretty good ball for, you know, the better part of two months. So I don't really know what to expect. I think they're trying to figure things out right now. And if you're trying to figure things out, like the Celtics are not the best team for you to play. They're probably the worst team for you to play at the moment. But my argument there would be, they've also been very easy to break down at times defensively. Now they've gone back to that double big lineup with Al Horford, Robert Williams, and their defense has just gone to a completely new level in recent weeks because of that. They did it a little bit with Grant Williams earlier in the season, but Rob being there just adds that that rim protection. Similar to what you're talking about with Mitch and how it is night and day without him. As you said, the Celtics probably have more depth in terms of defenders than what the Knicks do, which is shocking, right? Because Tibbs is a defense first guy and he seems to just have a bunch of attacking talent, no creators, and then where are the defense? Where's the defense? I like Hartenstein though. I, d- I would like to acquire Hartenstein in a muck trade, but I got killed on Instagram for that. So we're going to ignore the fact that I put out a muck trade, and we're going to move on. <clears throat> My biggest concern, and I, I'll put concern in quotation marks, is you never know what Julius Randall's going to be on a night, like on in on a game to game basis. You're either going to get this. Julius Randle that dragged the Knicks to the playoffs two years ago, or are you going to get Julius Randle that the Knicks wanted to kill six months ago? Yeah, and and, and it's kind of hard to be in between. Now I, I'm not claiming to have watched a ton of Knicks games this year. I've probably caught probably eight all season. What type of Randle are we getting now? Is it is it kind of a happy medium? So Randle's had an interesting year. Um, I'll start by saying that his. There are things that have been consistent the entire season. Um, His shot diet changed a lot from the last two years in that he um, he's gone back to them a little bit more of late, but he largely eliminated a lot of the long twos and like all the long twos that were were dropping when he made all NBA second team a couple years ago and didn't drop last year. He's mostly, you know, kind of eliminated those from his shot diet. So that's good. He's getting easier looks. Definitely attribute that to Jalen Brunson to some extent. That's good. Um, and his efficiency overall has gone up. His turnovers have, have gone down, although that's been more of a second half of the, of the season thing. The thing that really, I think, changed over the course of the year is, one, he was displaying a lot of the very, 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 very poor tendencies defensively over the first, I don't know, 20, 25 games or so that drove Knicks fans crazy last year. He's cleaned that up. Like he's, you know, he's, he's not, you know, going to be in the running for any all, all defense teams, but he's been better. Um, he's been better and he's trying and it's, it's, it's not as glaring, um, you know, his, his defensive deficiencies. So that's a good thing. And then the big thing, and this is, it really was pretty consistent for, well over a month. I mean, starting, I would say, in the beginning of December and really going through into the beginning of January. Like, his shot-making, um, his just his entire offensive repertoire 
reached a level that I don't think we've seen from him as an NBA player. Like even going back two years ago, he was just, he was putting the ball on the floor, but like in a way that was usually pretty good, like driving the rim, driving the lane, um, getting to the, I mean, God, he shot, he's just been, he's living at the line. He's been living at the line for a while. Over the last couple of weeks, that has subsided a little bit. He does dip into the old tendencies occasionally, like in the first quarter against the Raptors the other night. He had, I think, four turnovers. Um, cleaned it up as the game went on. I thought he actually played a pretty good game. Um, but, like, he's been good. He's been good. Julius Randle has not been the problem. I mean, some some Knicks fans will tell you that he's still the problem and that they'll never get anywhere until they move, move off of him. But, like, I think – the, the, he was in a really nice groove, like a really special groove, like a groove that had us looking at him like, wow, he really should make the all-star team. That's the, that's kind of subsided. Does it come back? You know, we'll see. He's also uh, only other thing I'll mention. He's been, he's been taking a ton of threes. I haven't checked the statistic in a while, but since like the end of November up until maybe a week or two ago, he had attempted more threes than anybody in the NBA, which is wild. Um, but and you know he hits him like a thirty five percent clip, which is okay when you're taking that. You're okay with volume, but I don't know if I want yeah. league leading volume at thirty five percent. The thing is, he needs to, like, he has to shoot it. And when when he like he can't hesitate for for the Knicks offense to function as well as it can. And like, you know, a lot of people have a lot of critiques about the Knicks offense, and some of those critiques are fair. They're sixth in the league in offense, which when you look at their talent is like is wild to me. Um, but they're good. They're effective. They like do the things that they do really well. Um, you know, they lean into their strengths. It doesn't always look pretty, but Julius is a big part of that. You know, he's been really good. Now you said one of the, one, a key thing that you said was Julius is not the problem. That is what well, ran. Yeah. You said Julius is not the problem. I now, don't think that he's mean, the problem. Yeah. But what that means to me is there is somebody who you think is the problem. You think no. they, there is a problem. No, 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 because, you know, Brunson has been amazing. Um, yeah. I think of late he has gotten some criticism that he's maybe the the pass shoot um, ratio is a little out of whack, shoots, shoots a little bit too much. I think it's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not – worried too much about that first of all because he makes a ton of shots he's incredibly efficient he makes you know and he's he's been a if you look at this team last year and you look at this team this year by far the biggest difference is Brunson and he is the the most important addition that I they've had probably in my lifetime he's been amazing so he's not a problem Quentin Grimes has been great quickly has been great um I think RJ has underwhelmed Personally, this year, am I going to pin their issues on him? No. I just think, again, right now, they're a top-heavy team. They don't have a lot of really functional depth. Um, and they're missing the biggest component to, to propping up their defense. And I think when you add all that up, like, that's why after what had been – like, uh, let me put it this way. For, a set, for a, an eight-week stretch – they lost one game by double digits, or even more than that. They lost one game by more than seven points. Won a lot of games, lost a bunch of close ones, and had one really bad performance against the Mavs at home. That was it for an eight-week stretch. And now over the last four days, four games, they've had like four of their like worst losses of the season. So it really has it been comes, right. That's the ebbs and flows of the season. That's just kind of how it goes. Like, and one loss can put you on a spiral anyway. The Celtics had that day lost to the Warriors. I think it was early December, like mid November. And then they went on their worst run of the season losing. I think they lost like six on the bounce or something. I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but they lost a few big games. Then they lost back to back games against the magic. Mm -hmm. Then they come back and they lost against the magic again. Earlier this week, uh, yes. making ma the Magic have the best record against Boston in the entire NBA. Like, I, it's wild. You can't make this shit up. I mean, one thing I will say is the third game for against the Magic, the most recent one, there was no Marcus Smart, no um, no Malcolm Brogdon, no Robert Williams. Do you know what I mean? Jason, like, there was people not playing. Jason Tatum decided to just disappear in the third quarter for a while, just due to stomach issues and. Whatever that may be, he said there was cramping. Uh, is what it is, you know. But 
the Magic have the best record now. What I'm question now, the question I've got for you is like, wh- where do you see New York finding success against Boston? Like, what areas of the game are you are you coming in? Like, we need to nail this specific aspect of the game if we want to stand a chance. Um, I mean, I'll go back to what we saw the last game, which is they need to figure out how to defend the three against this team. And that's going to be really hard. I think they still make, like, if you if you get them involved, I mean, and I know I just got done praising Julius Randle. He's still <laughs> a guy that if you put him in a lot of actions, you know, uh, screening actions up on the three-point line, like he's, and then the fact that the Celtics have, like, everybody could shoot who they put on the floor, um, he often will get confused and make the wrong decision. So they have to figure out how they're defending the three. But, like, it's not only him. Like, RJ, I think, has been – my biggest gripe with RJ this year is I think he, for the second year in a row, has regressed defensively to the point where he's – I mean, I don't know how to say. He's he's not a good defender. He's just a bad defender. Um, And he is not an asset on that end. And he can be exploited and – Offensive players, I think, too often do not feel him. And when you look at him, you look at a guy who's a six, 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 seven wing, whatever he is, he's in good shape, the whole thing. He looks like he should be a good defender. That's not what he is. But again, I don't want to pin the blame all on either of them because, like, we played the Raptors the other day and, like, Siakam, I think it was, or maybe it might have even been a Chua, I don't know, sets a high screen for Van Vliet. And it's Quentin Grimes is guarding Van Vliet. And Quentin Grimes has been, I would argue, their best defender all year. Like, inexplicably goes under the screen. Um, now, Van Vliet missed the shot. Uh, but, like, that wasn't the only ha- time that happened that game. Like, they're, they're you know, I think collectively they've just kind of been thrown off, especially, you know, by, by Mitch's injury. If they don't guard the three, they don't, they're not going to stand a chance in this game. Offensively, like, I'm actually not that worried. They're play, they're in a nice groove the last couple of games offensively. They have 27 and 30 assists the last two games after having a really sludgy offensive game against the Wizards. So they're they've been passing it pretty well. They've been nailing their threes the last couple of games. You've also um, got a few guys hitting quite a good clip on mid ranges, and with the Celtics, they like to kind of run like four guys switch, one guy drops. And yeah. Teams have, teams with mid range guys have generally found little pockets to kind of <sighs> keep things close. That's dicey though, because like yeah, always. It, it 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 is because like I I don't like they have Brunson. Brunson's oh like yes, Brunson is a good mid good mid range guy, but like you could tell when Brunson is getting to his spots where it's the mid rangers that he wants to take, and you could tell when it's teams getting him and forcing him into taking mid rangers that are maybe not in his wheelhouse. Um, and I like. For me, the Knicks offense is very simple. It comes down to just are they moving the ball enough? Are the players moving? Are they moving? And they get into these stretches where they don't move the ball enough. Um, And so they need to do that. They've gotten around those stretches this year because Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle have been so good at just hitting, you know, tough shots. And both of those guys have done a lot of that this year. And, And to his credit, RJ and, you know, he gets downhill and he, he, when he gets going downhill, he does make a lot of good contest, you know, maybe not contested shots, but like he makes, he does make tough shots um, on drives. So like they have those three guys quickly. He's been a really good offensive player. The only other thing I'll mention, and this has been again, sort of an issue of late is when Randall and Brunson both sit and they usually do both sit at some point in each half, the Knicks just have a, an incredibly difficult time scoring. And um, those off those units are usually try. It's usually RJ and quickly supported by Hartenstein McBride. And now that he's back, Obi Toppin and like McBride, really nice defensive player. If undersized, not a threat at all. Offensively. He's just not Hart Hartenstein. Um, I haven't looked, I haven't updated the numbers in like a week, but like, He's shooting like thirty five percent from the field or something like that over the last two months. He's he's it's just, really the fits falling. just not there, right? If well, I mean, if you listen to a lot of Nick fans, they'll tell you that Tom Thibodeau is just grossly misusing him, which I don't necessarily think is wrong. Um, he is not being used in the same way as he was used um, with LA last year, 
but LA also has a different, they have different personnel in their backup unit than, than the Knicks do um, uh, in, in any case. So yeah, Hardenstein's kind of been relegated to a zero um, and OB just had a really nice game. Um, it's his first nice game. It was his first nice game in about two months. So we'll see if he can contribute as well, but yeah, it's just for where the Knicks are at right now, they kind of need to play perfectly almost not hit every shot, but they need to, they can't really have any self-inflicted errors um, for them to be good teams. And they've had, you know, they've had self-inflicted errors over the last week. So I've got two quick ones for you because I know you press for time. So I want to play a very quick game called kick and Nick. And what we do on this game is we choose one member of the rotation to kick out of the rotation because they're going to be the target for the Celtics. So Jonathan Macri, you are taxed now with kicking the Nick. The target for the Celtics. I'm also um, proud of the alliteration here as well. Yeah, I like it. Um, hmm. I mean, the easy answer is Hardenstein. People, people have wanted to get him out of the rotation for, for two months. Um, this is just for the Celtics game, though. It's specific who has who's the biggest weak point that Boston will look to attack. Yeah, I, it's not about looking to it like, yeah, Hardenstein. I think it's Hardenstein, and I think it's Hardenstein because he offers nothing or he has offered very little on the defensive glass this year. Um, he stopped offensive rebounding, which is was a strength of his early on and has just it's hasn't really been of late. Offensively, like we talked about, he's not great. And his presence in the rotation is ostensibly the thing that is blocking Obi Toppin from getting more minutes. And I think yeah, you know, it'd be nice against a team like the Celtics. Like I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of them maybe doing a lot more switching on defense. Um, and if you have Obi in there with Julius and maybe go, go big again, it depends on if quickly is, is going to be able to go, but like, I think that would be a form. I think that would be as good a chance to beat the Celtics as anything. And I really don't feel like Hardenstein's giving me anything right now. So I would, I would kick Hardenstein out. This next game is based on the, the Mad Libs. Do you remember Mad Libs? Of course. So we're going to go, we're going to go Libs on tips. And what we want to know now is we want to know, I'm sticking with the alliteration all the way. It's dad joke time. What I want to know now is. What the hell is going on with um, Cam Reddish, man? Like, do you agree with what Tibbs has done by benching oh. him? Uh, do you think he had something to offer? Do you think there's something like, could you have developed him? Could he have been a good piece for you? Is is he going to another team? What's going on with Reddish? Uh, well, he's never playing for this team again. I can tell you that. Much. <laughs> um, that's you could you could write that in pen. Uh, no, I think it was. I mean, yeah, sure. If you want to blame Tibbs for that, I think a lot of people do. It, I think there's more going on um, than maybe has been made out. Um, I, I do not think it was a great fit. I don't think the way Cam um, perhaps responded to some uh, challenges and adversity this season, I don't know if that sat well with uh, some of the, some of the parties that be. Um, and it is not an accident that he is the only Nick that has not seen the court since the last game he played, which was a home game against Dallas in which he um, appeared to not want to be on the basketball court uh, with, with his teammates. Um, they'll trade him. I don't know if they're going to wind up trading him for a second or a couple seconds, or if they're going to be able to use his salary to acquire a player that actually helps their team, but they will, they will move on from him in short order. And uh, yeah, it was absolutely a failed experiment. Um, it was not a, not a great look for the front office to acquire him in the first place. They were never on the same page with Thibodeau. So yeah, it's just like, um, but I, I, you know, for anybody who is listening to this and it's like, wow, the Knicks are insane. They wasted a guy who was the former 10th pick in the draft. Like I've, I've said this a few times, any team in the NBA could have, since the summer could have had Cam Reddish for a song and, and nobody no one wants to touched him. No, one. <clears throat> absolutely. No one like the, the, um, the Lakers just made the trade. They gave up three second round picks for Rui Hachimura. Like I saw you tweet this out. Yeah. And uh, I believe 
Mark Stein, uh, I think it was Stein that reported like they like I think I'm fairly certain the Knicks would have done Cam for two of those seconds, um, and the Lakers would rather give up a third second rounder for Hachimura, who's a guy taking one spot ahead of Cam three or whatever it was four years ago, three and a half years ago. Um, anybody can have Cam, you know, for a couple of seconds. And now the final segment is called Marvelous Macri. And and this is this is where I'll just want like for anyone that's watching this, like I know that this is a new show, but it's definitely it's on a pod, uh, on a YouTube channel that we've been building for a while. Anyone that doesn't know Macri, he is the biggest Zach Lowe fan that exists Damn. in the entire universe. And recently, I wouldn't say well, a few months back at this point, you got to sit down and chop chew the fat with Zach Lowe for probably close to an hour, right? Uh, I think I had him for like 25 minutes, half hour. It was, it, it was great though. I just assumed there's always our fair talk. I always assume there's our fair talk. How was that for you, man? Like not just to cut, I like, I don't care about how the actual conversation went. I care about like for you personally, getting to sit down and chop it up with Zach. Like how was that for you knowing that you've kind of been like this guy shaped the way you cover the Knicks. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, yeah, it was cool because like I had reached out to him. Like we, I did. I got Mike Breen on for the four, for the three hundredth episode of the pod. I got um, Jeff Van Gundy on for the four hundredth, and I'm like, let me try to do one more big one for the five hundredth. And I tried to get Zach for five hundred, and it didn't exactly land on five hundred because he like he couldn't get you know do do the spot until like a few episodes after. But um, yeah, it was just it was cool because it was it it was one of those moments where it's like. I talked to Zach Lowe on a podcast about basketball. I can, you know, I could die in peace, like that type of thing. I, I can die in peace. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really cool. I mean, I'd prefer, I'd love the Knicks to win a championship before before I die. That would be nice too. But yeah, it was great. It was um, it was really kind of him to do it and spend the time and answer whatever ridiculous questions I had for him. Um, but yeah, he's the best, and uh, you know, I also know. He's a, you know, he's a dad. I know how busy he is. And I know to, you know, to give 25 minutes is, I know how big of a, I, I have, I, I have a, at least, I can imagine how big of a deal it is for him to do that. And I'm, cause I'm sure there's 8,000 people that ask him for 25 minutes and that he gave it to me. It was just really, um, you know. Did really he cool. know? Did he know how, like, that you were the Zach Lowe man? Like, did, did, was he aware of I don't know. I don't, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, did he leave knowing? I hope so. I hope I made it very clear to him that I was a huge fan and that I think very highly of him. Um, but yeah, Zach's the best, man. Zach's the best. You see, so I feel that way when I talk with you, and I feel that way. Feel <laughs> Seriously, though, man. That's Seriously, really, we've been doing this for a long time. Ridiculous um, and kind of you. Unkind or kind. Kind, kind. kind. I was like, what did I say, man? What did I say? Right. I know you're busy. I know that you're currently um, doing this from a classroom at work, educating the next, the minds of the next generation. So I'm going to let you go. I but appreciate you having me on. What I do want to know before you go is give me a prediction of a score. Oh, God. It's not going to be a good one. Um, well, I don't depends know. what team. I mean, this is Celtics fans watching this. Uh, Celtics by 10. You know, by 10. Yeah. I, I don't know what the actual score is going to be, but I'll say Celtics by 10. That's a big spread, man. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's really hard for them to put together a complete game right now. And um, again, I think, I, I don't know that there are a lot of teams right now that are, that are good matchups for the Knicks. I don't think the Celtics are a particularly good matchup for them. So, um, yeah, I I mean we did predictions on our pod last night and I I had the first I, I was my my I, I went first followed by Jeremy and I t- I took one and two for the week. We're playing the Cavs tonight and then the Celtics and then the Nets, which Durant will be out for. And I picked that they'll go one and two for the week. And I think this is the game that I would say is the least likely game that they are going to win. Which means it's probably the one they're going to win. Uh, last thing I'll say, if if I want to try to end on a high note for the Knicks, is like this team has surprised us, Knicks fans, a bunch of times this year. They, we thought the season was over when they were going on that West Coast trip. 
they won the first two games in Denver and in Utah um, on a back to back, two places that they never win. Granted, Jokic was out for the Denver game, but still, it was a it was a nice win. We thought the season was over after they got blown out at home by the Mavs, um, and they came back and they won eight in a row after that game, which was insane. Uh, we thought the season was over um, after they had two of the most devastating last second losses you could ever imagine seeing against the Bulls and the Mavs again, this time on the road. And then they came back after that and they won seven out of eight games. It's like this team has, they do have real character. They do have real talent. Um, They know how they have to play to win. They just don't always do it. And again, they're not, they're not whole right now. I would love for them to surprise me again. I would love for them to have one more surprise in store. I, you know, we'll see. Zach Levine would be the nice surprise. Right. We'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> Please, no. I don't want any part of Zach Levine. I just want to put it out there that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, when playing together, should cook almost every team. So I'm feeling confident. But, you know, I've been proven wrong many a time before, and I'll be proven wrong many a time again. Macri, man. I want to be on your pregame show. Uh, to I think we're recording tomorrow. So oh, awesome! Well. Yes, with with Andrew. Awesome, good stuff. With Andrew, so I'll be making a, a an appearance over on the Knicks Film School. In like you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Thank and, you. Uh, and, uh, thank you. You're the, it's a big platform sponsored by Madison Square Garden. Just so you we're know, we're sponsored by but, a lot of things. I don't know what what's what anymore. Okay, no need to rub it in. I'm only um, joking. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it.